Good day. Uh, once again, you're joining us on the movement. Uh, today we have uh, built one South Africa leader. This is someone who's uh, not exactly unpopular to South Africa, but uh, quite well known for his political activism. Uh, he's been into the DA and he's been a social activist on social media as well. Uh, Musim Amani, welcome to the movement. Hey, it's great to be here and thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Uh, now uh, it's election time and I'm sure you've been busy. How's campaign work going? Incredible. You know, uh, there isn't communities that don't uh, let us in. Um, there aren't, we're a party that represents all South Africans. So other than the busyness of sleeping in different provinces every night, mm. um, certainly enjoying campaigning for Build One South Africa, I think there's something about South Africans that we want. We want to work together. We want to fix our problems. Mm. I think South Africans are sick and tired of the politics that become political, that kind of take away agency from people. They want to be part of it. So I can tell you, yesterday, here I am in Peter Maritzburg, there's a community of teachers who want to fix their school. Here I am in, in Wentworth, there's a community there who want to fix their flats. They just don't have a government that's working with them. There are young entrepreneurs, business people who are saying, let's figure out a way where we can create jobs. So I'm excited about the vibrancy of this country because you know, I don't trust the politicians, but I, what I do trust is the people of this country. Wonderful. And of course, Build One South Africa, uh, you know, comes into uh, elections at a very tough time when there are uh, so many other political parties and, you know, so many offerings, people offering people different things, you know, people offering to change the constitution. Uh, but you speak about putting a job in every home. Uh, tell us about this and tell us why you think Build One SA uh, is coming into uh, the South African political landscape at the right time? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I, I have been myself in politics for for over a decade now. And so I've seen the best and the worst. Mm. I've seen how parliament can work and why it doesn't work. Mm. I've identified some incredibly talented people, some of them not who don't come from politics. They come from business, people like Bonobuntu and people like Ayanda Ali who come from media. And there are people who come from advocacy and different parties. They've all been supported by their communities. Mm -hmm. so, so the first thing that South Africans must be aware of is that actually it's about leadership that you can trust. And to that point, I don't actually think there are that many parties. To that point, I don't think that there are that many people that people must be considering voting for. Because when you look at the top five leaders in the country, mm. It's Jacob Zuma, Cyril Ramaphosa, Musi Maimane, Julius Malema, and I think it's Helen Zilla. Mm. That's what the top five looks like. So in that way, the choice then becomes, are you going to vote for Julius and the values that he stands for? Mm. Or are you going to vote for Musi and the values that I stand for? Or are you going to vote for Cyril and the corruption? So that's a simple, narrow choice that people are going into the elections with. So in that way, we've been able to narrow down the thing. And then at the same time as that, We've been able to, over the last number of years, identify candidates who represent communities. So when you ask me about putting a job in every home, it's not pollyanna -ish. We put two million as the figure of jobs that we've got to do in the next five years because we genuinely believe that in the households in this country, mm. if you put two million jobs, you'll be able to at least have the dignity of a person working up every day to go to work. And how we look at that is the first thing is let's fix the macroeconomic conditions, make sure the lights stay on, make sure water is flowing, make sure that logistics work as far as moving goods from the ports to inland, but furthermore, making sure that people can move from place to place. So we've looked at how we can do that from a policy point of view, but we've also wanted to introduce over 220 billion rands into the township economy so that it's not just a job in every home, but it's a job closer to home. You know, we grew up, my mother used to get up early in the morning and go far to go to work, come back late at night, never saw your mother. You never saw your father. But I want to make sure there's a job in every home and closer to home so that when we talk about the economy that must work, it's so that people, families can stay together, that we don't have this migrant labor that we had under apartheid. We want to make sure that young people have a national civilian service that gives them a year's program post-school mm. where they can spend six months interning and doing six months of actual work so that they walk away without having to say, let me prove my experience, but they've got that experience. We want to stimulate, particularly special economic zones, stimulate micro-enterprises there. I've introduced a Jobs and Justice Fund. You know, when I left Parliament, mm. 
I went into business and I wanted to be clear how you fund a business. You ensure that that business, in fact, is able to employ people. So, 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 so let me give you a practical example. I identify a young lady who was selling sanitary towels. Mm. She was hustling. We said, let's put some capital behind this lady. Mm. Let's, once we've put some capital, give her some mentorship through a successful business person. Mm -hmm. And then after that, partner her with the retail. Now she's one of the big distributors of sanitary towels. Now, that is someone who you identify, you get behind, they create a job, they put it in every home. And then ultimately, when government rolls out extended public works programs, let's ensure that those programs are built closer to communities and those communities are the first beneficiaries of activity in those programs. So what's happening now is, uh, you know, the tendering system has introduced a concept of, uh, you know, getting rich quick for, you know, young people like myself. Um, and tenders are seen perhaps Did you as get rich quick through tenders? Is that what you're no, saying? No, no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> I just want but, to know, man. But uh, this, is, this is what uh, is, is common among, you know, people my age, that the best way to get rich quick in this country is to get a tender. Um, my question is, how is your view of the tendering system? We've had others saying that, you know, government tenders need to be stopped and, you know, uh, business uh, needs to be taken, government business should be taken uh, into government itself. Government needs to carry out certain contracts themselves instead of uh, maybe outsourcing some of the work to, to private uh, enterprises. Uh, look, no, no economy is ever one or the other. You know, there's always public-private partnerships. So when you think about Transnet, and I know you are speaking about tendering. When you speak about Transnet, that must be split up and some components of Transnet need to be allowed to be run by the private sector to increase efficiency of certain aspects, right? Mm -hmm. In the rail space, I think we can introduce a competitive nature that allows a mix so that, so that we can increase the rollout of rail that we build in the country. In as far as municipal services are concerned, I don't think a municipality should be outsourcing who cuts the grass. Country must follow useless. Mm. The, the municipality itself must be able to cut grass. It must be able to articulate water. It must be able to fix potholes. It must be able to keep the lights on. Otherwise, that municipality is useless. Mm -hmm. So tendering, has be especially under an ANC government, mm -hmm. has become what others would call neo-patrimonialization, which is a way of introducing patronage to your system, and you fulfill a triangle of corruption. Mm -hmm. The government issues you with a tender, where now you pay for the buses for their rally, and then they have a rally where they capture the state, and so the triangle keeps going on. That is classic corruption, and it corrupts the minds of our people mm. because it eventually tells those who are beneficiaries of those tenders, or no, the only business I can do is with government. What nonsense is that? Mm. Government business is only uh, less than 25% of the total GDP in this country. So once you've even got a government tender, you are only competing in a small pool. You want to ensure that... That, that, that you can compete in the fullness of the economy. Mm. Let's empower businesses who can do that. So for me, let's forget this tender business at the local level. Let's create a jobs and justice fund, get behind people with actual capital so that they can compete not only for public work, but also for private work. When you, well, let's say you manufacture, uh, you, let, let's say you cut grass. Let mm. me just use that as a basic business. Mm. Sure, cut grass in a municipality, but cut grass it, in, in other sectors, why, why are you not trading with Discovery? Why are you not trading with big businesses, mines, etc.? Yeah. If you provide security, it shouldn't just be security for the municipality. It must be security for the industry at large. So, 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 so corruption has meant that now we end up with what is a term typically called tenderpreneurs, mm -hmm. who are ANC cadres who eventually don't have the competence to do the work, and they eventually corrupt the entire system. Let's talk about water just for 30 seconds because water has become the next crisis. Mm. And what these guys do is they're able to get uh, the water contracts. They, they deliver these tankers, mm. which means they're in council. And then they go break and vandalize reservoirs because now it affects their businesses. Mm. Why do we have load shedding in this country? We don't just have load shedding because uh, demand has outstripped supply. We have load shedding because the ANC lot want to be able to open the bid windows for IPPs and give them to politically connected people. So you need load shedding to create that crisis. We, we could have looked at this issue differently by saying, let's make sure the rooftop of every school, hospital, police station, 
has got solar panel. That way you reduce demand and you ensure that the current supply that we've got through ESCOM meets that and you allow citizens and empowerment to be able to reduce that demand by building, build own operate models where mines and etc. can take themselves off the grid. But the government isn't going to do that because this, the entire system is corrupted. So the thing that we've got to fix, if you want to get rid of load shedding, you want to get rid of corrupted tendering, mm -hmm. get rid of the government. Let's change the government. You'll see the system will change. It's even in education. They are now issuing tenders left, right, and center. If we're going to fix education in this country, we need to free it up to be able to do the job it was designed to do. The unions now have got a different model where they are the ones appointing the principals in all the schools so that the principals can work for them. That's, that's a way of creating a patronage system that is corrupting. They are corrupting the entire society. Because it's only a matter of time before even in our streets, and our communities, mm. to your point, the role models are those who are tender premiers. Now, Ronan, unfortunately, we grew up under apartheid, right? Yeah. And Negrigo Dobsi. But you know what was powerful about being in Dobsonville? And I hate apartheid. I hated Group Areas Act. But Group Areas Act meant for people like Agrit Laste, mm. who was the editor of the Soweto lived in our street. He lived in our community. Oh, interesting. You could see these role models. Mm. People, the headmaster, lived in our street. So, so you could see the role models. When you thought of success growing up, mm. you looked at the people because Group Areas Act forced you to live there. Now I accept today as we've repealed all of those laws and thank God for that. People move and they live somewhere so that you stand on the highway, you see the people traveling with their cars out of Dobsonville mm -hmm. on, on Sunday night and mm -hmm. back on Friday to come and jam there, etc. But we need a different form of role modeling. We need to show our young people or get educated in front of it. You can make it to the top. That's why, for me, I'm grateful that I haven't risen through tender mechanism. Of course. I've literally sat down and I had a great primary school, Gotopsi, that helped me. I had a Incredible headmistress, Sister Christina, who helped me. Today, I'm completing a PhD because I've st stuck it out and said, let's get into the books, Bafetu. We'll make it. And one thing I noticed, people don't actually know your, your academic background. I, I had an interview, of course, and the first time I got to find out about your you know, academic credentials. Could you just give us a few of your accomplishments? <laughs> no, <laughs> I've got a, an undergrad degree in psychology, uh, diploma in theology, a master's in theology, a master's in public administration, and now I'm completing a PhD in uh, local government economics. And, you know, your interest in theology, does it come from the fact that you were in a Catholic school? Where does that come from? Partly that, uh, but also, furthermore, I felt when I was, uh, I'm a person of deep faith, I love God, and I think had it not been for my faith, I wouldn't be here, to be honest with you. And therefore, my interest in theology wanted to ask the question, how do we translate what we believe often into the value of humanity? You see, you see if, if for anything, there are many things that are excesses of Christianity. And when people think about Christianity, they think about it as this religion sometimes of a God who hates sinners and all of that. People think about it like that. Of course. But to me, it's given me a love for humanity. Mm -hmm. It's given me the value of Ubuntu that when I look at you, I see the divine. Of course. And I see someone, that's why I hate racists, because I think if you are racist, you hate God. Mm. You know, how can you, you hate, a, you hate someone that's created by the creator, so you must hate God. Mm. You, when, when, someone, when someone prevails in a society upon which Others are throwing away food when others are begging for food and begging and building their own toilet. That degree of inequality delivers a society upon which the dignity of human beings is being robbed because of poverty. Mm. When you don't create an economic model that asks you the deep questions about how do you see society in its conscientization and being able to say that families must stay together is important not because... I'm a conservative, but because a, we know that a child who comes from a family is able to stay through school, 
We know that a young girl who is raised by a father who looks after them delays sexual activity, etc. We know those things. Science research has shown us that. Mm -hmm. So, so if you know those things, how then do you not, as someone who has a faith and a conviction, fight for those things to find to find them in legislation that helps those things? So, so to me, it's become this drum that I tend to to march to, that invites me to go literally love my neighbor. And loving my neighbor says, I'm going to do my best. That When I talk about a job in every home, it's not just some fancy thing. It's just yeah. you, you love because now people can work. And, and so I'm inspired by a heritage of leaders like Martin Luther King, who fought for civil rights because he was a person inspired by faith. People like even in some ways, Gandhi, who wanted to see a different type of revolution take place. Mm. People like Beas Nodia, who confronted apartheid when he faced up to it and said, apartheid is a sin and therefore we must be able to change it. In fact, the founders of the ANC were in many ways ministers who got together and said, apartheid is evil, we must fight against it. So we cannot sit here today and not have a place upon which we draw deep inspiration to be able to fight for social change. Now, speaking about apartheid, some would have criticized um, your um, joining the DA, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of saying yeah, you're joining a party which is not for black people, uh, yet again made worse by the fact that you were at some point at the helm of the DA. Uh, do you think that we unfair criticism of yourself? It's up to what your beliefs are. Mm -hmm. You know, when I joined the DA, I was looking for an organization that, at the time, this was my belief. It did not steal people's money. And I thought that, at the time, governance was an important frame in the revolution. Mm. Remember, when you fight a struggle, you must, you must, you must at first, as, as the Kenyan said, at first you must be liberated, mm. and then you must liberate yourself from the liberators. So if you think about it that way, I came from the NC. They would class themselves as the liberators. Mm -hmm. But I would dare say today they are starting to act in a way that resembles those who are oppressed. Of course. Now, in my joining of the DI, I knew that the next phase of this country, and I still believe that, by the way, the next phase of this country must be building. We don't need more protest. Mm. We need to build. Infrastructure, the infrastructure of Johannesburg, the road infrastructure is collapsing, bridges are collapsing, all of that. Yeah. So I was looking for an organization that did that. I joined the DA because I believed in non-racialism. I wanted to build a party where black people, white people, Indian people, colored people can thrive together. Mm. And to be honest with you, when we governed 2016, I'm sure you can testify, this was an organization that was representing all South Africans. Of course. Governing in Johannesburg, governing in Kabecha. So yes, you are criticized at first. In the same way, as anyone who left the National Party and said, I want to fight against apartheid and happened to be white, mm. they were criticized. Mm. Those people were looked upon. They, people said to them, you are betraying the National Party. Mm. So when I left the NC and joined the DA in this sense, to fight and be able to bring change, people were like, you are betraying the struggle. Mm. That criticism must come. But we built an organization that represented all of that. And like anyone, you know, you have the best intentions. I mean, I'm sure people get married and then after a number of years wake up and say, this is not what I thought this one was. Mm -hmm. In the same way as I joined the DA, eventually I got to a point after 2019 when many Afrikaans voters were moving to the Freedom Front Plus and people said, no, we blame my money for the loss of Afrikaans voters. I said, I'm building with South Africans of all walks of life. So sure, there will be some voters who will move to the Freedom Front Plus, as there will be some black South Africans who say, I can't work with the whites, I'll move to, to black parties in that sense. Mm -hmm. I will work with South Africans who want to go work together. They said, no, we want to become a minority party. And then we started to fight. You had two visions, mm -hmm. a vision for one South Africa and a vision for those who said a minority South Africa. I said, I'm not going to stay in this environment. And I took the courage to leave parliament, all the infrastructure, mm -hmm. money, salary. The benefits. Benefits. Mm -hmm. I joined unemployed people. 
Uh, and unfortunately, at the time, there was no 350 social relief distress grant, so we had to hustle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so <coughs> my point, broadly speaking, is in life as a leader, you don't have much else. You've only got your convictions. You, you, you've only got what you believe. I have consistently, inside the DA, if you look at the list of the DA in 2019, 50% mm. of it were people of color. As I fought. So when people say to me, you didn't do, I said, I fought inside the DA. That's why they couldn't handle some of the changes we were, we were, being, we were, we were fighting to bring. And even now, no one, isn't it strange to you that if you start an organization called Build One South Africa, that no one inside the DA says, we want that brand. That's our brand. Mm -hmm. It's not their brand because they know they are not building one South Africa. So you can walk away with it and go own it, and say, I'm going to build it wherever I go, and build on the legacy uh, of people who said, like man, you know, you know people, people today bastardize the legacy of, of, of Mandela, yeah. and forget that actually Mandela, even in his speech at the Ravonia trial, we quote the line that says, I fought against black domination, we fought against white domination. Yeah. But we don't follow the context of the speech. Mandela was fighting for the education of Africans. Mm -hmm. He was fighting for the enfranchisement of Africans and make the case to say the enfranchisement of the one is not the disenfranchisement of the other. Meaning that if you liberate people, that doesn't mean to take away the freedoms of others. Mm -hmm. So my worry is that today parties, and I will say particularly the DA, sometimes thinks to itself that the inclusion of blacks is the limitation of the rights of whites. Mm -hmm. And I'm still continuing the fight that says the liberation and the advancement of black people is the prosperity of all South Africans. And therefore, white South Africans join the struggle to say it is important for the stability of this country that we fight to liberate, to enhance, to advance all South Africans. Because if we don't, this country should never have peace. It must be in the interest of the person who's living in a leafy suburb, as it were, yeah. to be concerned about what happens in townships. It should, it, should, it should be in our shared interest that when 75 people are being murdered every day in this country, the majority of which are in townships, mm -hmm. that safety threat is not a threat of just people in the townships. It's a threat of all of us. In the same way, when a farmer is murdered in a farm, it is a concern for all of us. Because if you take out one of us, whether black or white, you've taken out a South African. And you become the enemy of the people of this country. And we must deal with criminals. So to me, mm. I, I believe that in my blood, I can't, I can't betray that. So when I look at the ballot paper today uh, uh, for 2024, sometimes I'm saddened to see that we still today in 2024 have black parties, white parties, colored parties, Indian parties. It, it, it saddens me because then you are dealing with demography. You are saying, go express your, your race. Eh? We must be fighting to express our ideals. And that's why I can't. I'm married to a white South African. We've got mixed race kids. Mm -hmm. That's who we are as a family. And that is the dream I hold for this country. Not in a kumbaya sense, but in an economic sense also, but also in a safety sense and in an educational sense. You know, you know, just down the road here in Soweto, the education of children in Quintal 1, 2, and 3 schools mm. renders them for unemployment. Quintal four and five schools, which are high-fee paying schools, renders them for prosperity. Would you, would you say that they're not receiving the same education? The quality is poor. Let me take you to Orlando, where the school was built, it was left there to rot. Let me take you to Tembisa, where you arrive there and you get the school there built on swamps. Let's go to the Eastern Cape, where children are still using pit latrines. Let's go to places, sometimes in some schools I was in KZN, people are imagining what a computer is in 2024. So you're saying there's nothing to celebrate. I mean, Angie Musekha stands there every year when matric results are released. And she says, um, you know, uh, I'm putting more kids 
into the bachelors and putting more kids to achieving diplomas. And, you know, most of these kids are likely to end up in university, regardless of, of, of uh, the poverty they may have come from. Two out of three young people are unemployed in this country. If you want to talk about the educational proof, look at that. When we say 81%, 81% of the children passed, what is that 81% of, considering the fact that over 40% of them would have dropped out of school? When we look at the fact that our children are passing at 30%, if you pass at 30%, yeah, sure, increase the pass rate. In fact, if you want to get a 100% pass rate, make it 10%. Mm -hmm. Because then the lower you put the mark, the higher the pass, the pass rate is. Mm -hmm. IEB children are not passing at that level. I, I, quintal five kids are not passing at that level. Look at maths marks. Let's take maths. Take yeah. mathematics. Ask NG how many children in this country are passing mathematics at over 50%. You'll discover that number is less than 50%. Which means children who start mathematics do not pass it at 50%. So yes, once you do the scores and all of that, even the ones where she's saying she's sending kids to a bachelor's, when you look at that number, I think it's about 41%, if I'm not mistaken, mm. of, the, of the kids. Really? You, 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 if you do the calculations as to what it means to get a bachelor's pass mark, mm -hmm. that we can't achieve a higher rate of that where IEB schools are getting closer in the higher, in the higher 80s for that same indicator. It tells you that something is wrong in our education system. So I will do this. Let's celebrate excess. Mm -hmm. But let's not deny the fact that the quality of the education in this country is certainly that one, not one that prepares our kids to compete in the world. And we, we pat ourselves in the back for absolute mediocrity. Pels, the Pels report tells us that 8 out of 10 of our children cannot read for meaning by the age of 10. How is it that if 8 out of 10 can't read for meaning by the age of 10, suddenly they get to matric and passing at 81%? Mm. Come on. This is, this is manga manga business. Guys, you're still sitting with the Citizens Movement. Uh, click, like, share. Um, we're still sitting with Musi Maimani. Uh, now, Musi, after you left the DA, um, there are talks that Herman Mashawa asked you to come over to Action SA. Uh, is that true and what happened with that? Yeah. Herman and I spoke a lot. We discussed a number of things. We wanted to initially start a party together and then we got to a point where he was like, no, come and, come and work for Action SA. I, was like, oh. I thought we were talking about shared leadership. Mm -hmm. Talk about how we build this country forward. I, uh, and I think it's important to reflect on the fact that if we really want to build together, and I've engaged Action SA, but let's not form a parallel DA. I didn't want a branch of the D. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want a black D. I wanted a new movement for all South Africans. Mm -hmm. And we disagreed on that issue. Because if you want to achieve that, there are things that you've got to do. I mean, if you don't believe me, look at all the provincial leaders and premier candidates of Action SA, and you'll see all of them are former DA provincial leaders. Of course, yeah. If you want change, you want voters who are disillusioned with the ANC and new voters coming on board? They will, those ones weren't going to vote for the DA. Mm. Give them an alternative that speaks to their ideals. That's why our candidates are chosen by communities, mm -hmm. where communities come from. That's why our founding chair, Kusta Jack, is an ex-ANC person. Not because, because we didn't want, we wanted an organization that represents South Africans. Mm -hmm. That's why you get our candidate, Bumuzuli Rakivane, who was the former chief of staff to the chief justice, standing and leading in our organization. Mm -hmm. You build a movement of people like Kathy Berman, who is a Jewish South African, who's joined, used to be part of the UDF. Mm -hmm. If you want to do that, be courageous to really build something that reflects South Africans. And if I'm not sure that Herman is convinced of that, and so then you'll always end up with a clash of vision. Of course. And uh, in terms of uh, independent candidates, I mean, 
in the media, you've been seen as beheading the cause of independent candidates. You've been up and down the constitutional court over the same matter. Uh, what motivated you? And uh, for people who don't understand how this issue with the independent candidates work, uh, why would you say you were passionate about it? You know, people confuse partly that we're fighting for independence. But we're actually fighting for constituencies. Mm -hmm. You see, when you are in parliament, Parliament works like this. It meets on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It says on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday is what is called constituency period. Mm. Each political party is given money for what is called constituency funding. But mm. what do they do with that money? They use it for party building. They don't use it for the constituency. Mm. The country must be split up into constituencies so that when you say you are an MP for Soweto, mm. the budget that government gives you to say it's a constituency budget means that you must put an office there and when people want to ask you about a school, about a clinic, about, about a hospital, a, say a, a police station, they can talk to you as their MPL or their member of parliament. Mm. So that was the system since 1994 because we thought we would arrive at a point where we would um, amend the Electoral Act so that it's a constituency-based model. Mm. But the ANC and the DA figured out that, no, this benefits us too much. Let us look after our pockets. Mm. So they took the, the constituency funding and said, let's protect it and use it for our own self. So when I went to the Concord, we could identify this issue of independence at a provincial and national level as a way to say, how do we amend the electoral law? So that, as Judge Malanga said in that judgment, freedom of association must also mean freedom of disassociation. Mm -hmm. So that if the Koi and the Sun say, I want to elect so-and-so to go and stand for us, they don't have to have a political party, but that person can go stand for an election. Mm -hmm which is what our system was built to do. The reason we have state capture is because people fear the party more than they fear the people. Mm. The reason why presidents behave in such a way that they don't care what the people think mm. is because they don't fear the people. That's why we all sit at Nazareth and we watch, even if you are not ANC, you are watching there starting to, to, to get chest pains because you are thinking the president of the country has been elected there. No, the president of the party has been elected there. We, the people, must elect the president. Mm. So my court case, really, is about in amending the Electoral Act, bring it to a constituency-based model, let citizens who also choose not to be associated to compete, that we've won as a, as a first struggle because now you'll have three ballots of which the third is for independence. Mm. But BOSA is standing for in both the two ballots, national and provincial. And then fourthly, let's amend it to such a point that we give meaning to what is a constituency that one day it will happen. If you want to amend the constitution, let us directly elect the president. SADC as a region, mm. Zambia, Zimbabwe, all have direct elections of the president. So that you fear the people. You, you must, you, 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 we are electing leaders who are servants of parties, not servants of the people. And now, uh, a few weeks ago, we saw the DA writing a letter to the US asking for intervention into South African politics and uh, watching over the elections. Uh, do you think it was a bit um, uh, a reach in terms of uh, the DA? And uh, do you think the ICE is capable of, of ensuring that we have free and fair elections? We must protect the IEC at all costs mm. because the surest sign to destroy a democracy is to mess with its referee and ultimately that's the IEC. Mm. Nevas Mumba, the vice president of Zambia, former vice president, went and observed the elections in Zimbabwe and declared that they were not free and fair. Mm. President Ramaphosa was one of three presidents in Africa who attended that inauguration to go endorse criminality. So if you are willing to endorse rigged elections next door to your house, it means you are okay with them happening in your house. Mm. If the DA were actually serious about this thing, not trying to 
go and import. I was in the U.S. in January. Mm. The U.S. has got problems of democracy. Real problems. President Trump is challenging the legitimacy of their own elections. Now, I may, I may not agree with President Trump, but the, the U.S. is undergoing, as far as democracy is concerned, is the worst model at this point in time. Mm. Because they themselves will tell you that the electoral college is not working. They themselves will tell you gerrymandering is a problem. They themselves will tell you that, that meddling by international actors in a digital voting is a problem for them. Now, why do you go ask them? Mm. You are asking people who are battling with their problems of democracy to come and observe your problem, your, your democracy. Mm. How? Ask Nevers Mumba, because he's observed an election a number of times and had the courage of conviction to say that election is not free and fair. Mm. And you see, election observer missions are sometimes criticized for being a bunch of amateurs watching professionals steal an election. Mm. You need people who, have, who know what it looks like to steal an election. They, they come here, they look and they say, oh, the lines were there, the ballots were there, the scanners were working. That's not how you rig an election. Mm. You rig it on Monday and Tuesday when there are special votes. You, 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 you rig it when counting takes place. That's why you need parallel tabulation. We needed an African to come and make the point. But the DA sometimes doesn't believe competence sits in the continent. Would you take initiative of perhaps consulting with African leaders for, for such a, a, a move? Or Absolutely. I'm already in the process of doing that. Uh, what have you done? Because the reason I'm dealing with, the, I, I, as you know, we started the South African Democratic uh, Partnership uh, for Democratic Change, and that deals with opposition leaders in Zimbabwe, Zambia. You'll remember that when the Zambian president was locked up, mm. I was the only one who went there got arrested there, fought mm. for him, and now today is the president. Because this is not a new thing. Mm. I've watched these dictators in Africa create problems wherever they go. Nelson Chamisa in Zimbabwe, I'm working with. Mm. You'll remember Lazarus Chaguera when mm. the elections in Malawi were rigged mm. and there was a TPEX election. We fought that issue. I hosted Lazarus Chaguera here in South Africa and fought that issue. Mm. Uh, I've been liaising with people in, with our opposition in Tanzania, mm. in, 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 in um, Zanzibar. We've been dealing with Angolans, dealing with the Namibians. So we know what is going on in Sadek. Mm. Well, this is not populism. It's, it's, a, it's about actually working out how elections are rigged, what the problems are, how can we support. That's why I have a problem with Emerson Mnangagwa. He has an illegitimate mandate. Mm. Yet we endorse it. That's why, so, so, so that's why I'm committed to bringing everybody that we create that structure to keep fighting for free and fair elections. And South Africa must be observed. Botswana goes to elections in the second half of this year. Mm. Uh, I'm hoping I will be there to go and join the opposition there mm. and ensure that the elections are free and fair. It's, if you ask Botswanians today, what is your biggest concerns about the elections there? They will tell you it's the freedom and fairness of elections. And maybe now moving back to um, you know South African politics, so many things have happened. We see, we've seen the speaker being arrested. Uh, there's now the MK party. Uh, do you think there's a you know a change in South African politics? Uh, you know what do you think is happening in this Com country? Completely, it's the best time to be alive in South Africa politically. Mm. We are seeing profound change. We are seeing beautiful opportunity. Mm. This is the sad thing though. And it happens in many African democracies. Mm. Uh, the liberation movement splits into fragments and uh, mirrors of itself. What's the difference between Zuma, MK, and the NC? What's the difference between the EFF and the NC? Mm. They are all, is a family, they're a branch of each other. So if we want more ANC, then those parties 
whether you vote for MK, you vote for EFF, or vote for NC, it's all the same. So, so what we've got to fix for is the emergence of the center. Mm. The politics of non-racialism, centrist ideology, a view that says, can we have public-private partnerships, education that improves effectively? How do we build a job in every home? Because, you know, yesterday I was in KZM. Yeah. You can't help but feel that MK is also tribalist in some ways. Uh, are you basing it on language or are you basing it on... Because we don't even know their manifesto policies. So what are you basing it That's, on? There's a dominance there in KZN. It's not a dominance in Western Cape or Eastern Cape or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So to me, we have to build an alternative from the politics of the ANC. Because they're all the same. They are, they are all the same. When you look and you feel, it's all the same things. Yeah, sure, personality here, yeah, personality there, differences in style and articulation. One wears a beret, one wears a spear, another one wears black, green, and gold. Who cares? It's the same thing. They have no plan for education. They have no plan for jobs. They have no plan for safety. They've got nothing. Mm. Just, we are us. Us for what? <laughs> this country does not need more, but we're protesting here. We need building and policy. Well, you know why? Mm -mm. South Africa is competing not among within itself. We are competing with the world. Other countries are discussing chat GPT. Rona, we are obsessed with an 80-year-old. Really? Other countries are asking themselves the question, what does education look like, education of the future? How do we modernize our economies? How do we ensure that our foreign policies are aligned with uh, international trade? How do we ensure that we, th they are thinking about the world differently? Could we countries, perhaps... Let, let, let me just close it here. You know, you think about countries like Malaysia. You mm. think about countries like Japan, mm. South Korea. They started in some ways, if you took their GDPs in 1994, mm -hmm. and you say, where are they now relative to where we are? Those countries have beaten us Ogari, you know, 10, 20 times. That's how far back we've fallen. So now we live in Sadek. We've got minerals, palladium. We've got battery technology. We've got all of that. Why are we not saying South Africa will become the hub of manufacturing for electric vehicles? Mm -hmm. No, let's rather discuss Nossive View. Those people must go to jail, man. But are we, do you think we're hanging on to the past? I mean, um, you know, I find it uh, a bit interesting that we still sing struggle songs in our political expressions. Um, some would argue it's because we're not completely free. You know, the, the debate about economic freedom for black people. Do you think there's still a need to be singing struggle songs? Do you think there's still a need to be wearing military gear that uh, the MK1 where before mm. it got disbanded? Mm. Is there a need for... Um, Perhaps there is of a reminder that, uh, you know, a black person was called a K-word. Um, is there a need for all of that today? History serves to educate us, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a way of managing the history of a nation that it doesn't cripple you. Our problem is that we are remembering our history in a manner that cripples our, th our thinking about tomorrow. So let me take Germany as an example. Worst atrocity in the world as far as the Holocaust is concerned. Mm. How do they remember? In, in the West, how do they remember the Holocaust? You can go to Germany. In the middle of Berlin is a memorial. There's a way of educating. They teach their young people. But you can't take away from the fact that equally so, West and East Germany had to be integrated, which meant there were needed to be land reform issues, similar issues we are discussing, mm. tax. But when you look at the GDP of Germany today and them being in manufacturing and innovating around environmentally sustainable issues, Germany has outstripped us. Mm. Rwanda, genocide took place in Rwanda. It's a 30-year anniversary, literally, I think it was two days ago. You go to Rwanda today, Rwanda is a different country. They haven't 
They've built memorials. They figured out how to tell the story and preserve themselves from not being able to repeat that today. And Paul Kagame has led Rwanda to a point where today, Rwanda will soon be described as the Malaysia of Africa. Mm. Rona, we've anchored ourselves in yesterday and failed to frame it in such a way that we take that and say, let's never repeat apartheid, but let's build for the future, that it makes the memory easier to live with. Mm. At this point in time, because we've built an economy where in some instances a woman has to leave uh, their home at four in the morning, leaving their children, travel for hours, all in time so that they can be a domestic worker in another suburb, just to put out the slippers, mm. reminds the wound. So if you don't build an economy, if you don't do the things of innovation and focused on the future, you make that wound, that scab, that wound, continue to seep the pain of apartheid. So, so, so to me, I think South Africa has forgotten that to heal is to focus on what tomorrow must look like. In but, a way. but do you think black people were cheated at Kodesa? Do you think the good negotiations could have taken a different turn? Yeah, there are many things. I think our leaders in 94 did the best they could. We could have ended up in a violent South Africa. You know, there are more people who were killed in 1990 to 1994 than in all of apartheid. So let's place the, the period of transition in context. Mm. There are a lot of things we could have done differently, but I still think we've got a constitution that allows us to do the things that would have advanced blacks. But we had a government that failed. Great stuff. And that is... So let me give you the contrast. Mm -hmm. Starting 2000 to 2008, South Africa was building more houses than there were sheikhs. Our GDP was growing at 5% or just thereabout. We started to introduce things like counter-cyclical budgeting, mm -hmm. and we created a budget surplus. After that, we decided, well, no, let's allow what is going on here now. So even within the same time period, we have moments where we've looked at and said, actually, we can make this thing happen in the same constitution. Mm. But then today, those who are failing want to hark back at saying the constitution is a limitation, we were robbed, we were this. My brother, we, if we keep having that conversation, we will never hold our leaders accountable because just like they blame the constitution, Others will blame immigrants, and then they are scot-free, whenever they walk around freely. Mm. Me, I'm saying, within the current constitution, as I have it today, mm. a lot can be done to develop people. That constitution empowers us to do a lot of things. In fact, that constitution if, is, is, gives powers, even to the president, that are extraordinary. You can change this country within the same constitution. You don't need a new one. People talk about expropriation without compensation. There are expropriation laws in the Constitution. There are... Section 25 allows you and I to own land. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm, I'm a bit baffled why we are wanting to, to amend the Constitution, but we are not wanting to build capability into the state. Because it does not matter. It's like saying to people, wait a polo. Mm. Let's change the soccer rules, Batum. The soccer rules do not work. <laughs> Regil, we are, we'll keep losing if we don't change the soccer rules. Come on, build strong players and win within that game. Of course. Garowitz, now I'm mourning Kaiser Chiefs, Batum. That's all. Musi, I'll give you the last um, you know, few minutes of the show uh, to just express to um, viewers, uh, our audience, online why they need to vote build one essay and uh, perhaps uh, what you think that the future would look like after may 29 i think uh, first and foremost i think you want leaders who have seen both triumph and have seen failure i have i've seen how the highs of this country and I've seen the lows of it. I myself has experienced highs and experienced lows, which gives me 
not only the parliamentary experience, but also the business experience to be able to steer the fortunes of this country. I believe that the future of this country is non-racial, not racial division. Mm. I believe that the future of this country, I see a nation where ultimately, when we say we've got to put a job in every home, I, I, I think that it's possible because a job isn't just about earning money. It's about a child waking up to see someone else get up to go to work so that it gives them someone to model upon. Mm -hmm. It restores dignity within the home. I think that it shouldn't just be the criminals who are walking around freely. It should be the citizens and the criminals must be locked away. And to do that, we need to decentralize the police, bring them closer to the ground. Mm. I think it's tantamount to Bantu education when we ask our children to pass at 30%. We must get our children to pass at 50% because they can compete with anyone in the world. We are not competing with one another. We are competing with a child in Beijing, in Singapore, in America, mm. in the UK, we're competing with those children. And we want to be best at those. And South Africa has shown whether you can take the Sia Colises, the Trevor Noah, the Charlize Therons, or you can even take those who are inventing great businesses that are trading over the, all over the world, we've shown that we can succeed. And I want to be able to unleash what sits already within our people by giving them the best education to compete. But lastly, let's doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what plans I might put before you. What matters is we can build a capable government. And I can tell you now, the list of Bossa does not have a single criminal in it or anyone who's corrupt. We've got talented people. I've said that to go to parliament, you need a degree. And we forced our candidates to, if they don't have one, they must work on one and get one. And most of our candidates are degreed people because I think we need to raise the standard of debate even within parliament. But build a capable government that is able to deliver for all the people. So if you vote for Bossa, you are voting for those ideals. And really, you are combining experience with a new crop of leaders so that we can steer the fortunes of the new South Africa. Not trying to have a dream for our parents, but have a dream for our children. So I guess the best way I could close this is this, if you are thinking of voting and you have to vote, vote in such a way that your children will be proud of your votes you made. This is no longer about voting for ourselves. My daughter is 13. In 2024, she will be, in 2029, she will be 18 and vote for the first time. I hope I'll be able to look her in the face and say, how I voted or what I did in 2024 protected your future. That's why you can vote in a way that's proud. We mustn't have people one day, one day is going to happen in this country that people, you're going to ask them, did you vote for the NC? And they're going to deny it, like those who denied voting for apartheid. Let us vote for new. This election is not a competition between big parties and small ones. It's old versus new. So let's vote in such a way that our children will be proud of our choices. That's why I say vote for Bossa because that's what your children want. Shut up. Uh, so that was the Khutman from Dobsonville. Uh, we apologize to all the Kaiser Chiefs fans for the example he made. <laughs> <laughs> it's my team. It's my team. Oh, you're a Pirates fan. No, I'm a Chiefs. I'm a Makosi. There we go. So, um, so Makosi, please vote for Bossa, as you heard. Uh, there's your man right there. Uh, next, uh, Join us for the next episode of uh, The Movement next week. Thank you. Cheers.